I woke up early on day six, ready for a long day of driving the wild Atlantic Way up to Northern Ireland to see the Giant's Causeway. I didn't have very much time in Northern Ireland, so I thought I would take the scenic route. I was only about 25 minutes into my drive and I came onto a wild spot in the road called Corkscrew Hill. I obviously didn't get any footage of it, I was just holding on tight, but this place was equally as beautiful as it was terrifying to drive for the very first time. As my mom would say, the corners are so sharp you almost meet yourself on the other side. But I didn't want to stop until I got to Sligo where I was planning on getting gas and breakfast. As I was driving along, lost in thought, I turned a corner and there in the distance was this giant green mountain dominating the landscape in front of me. My first thought was to pray that I don't have to drive up that thing. My second was just awe. I didn't know it at the time, but I learned later that its name is Ben Bulbin, and it's the site of several Irish tales, including the pursuit of Dermot and Grania, and it was also the setting for a Yeats poem called Under Ben Bulbin. And legend says that it is the only place where fairies are visible to humans. And if I'd have known that, I would have stopped to take in the sights. six and a half hours of driving, I finally arrived at the Giant's Causeway. The Giant's Causeway is made up of 40,000 interlocking basalt columns that are the result of an ancient volcanic fissure eruption around 50 to 60 million years ago. But according to legend, the columns are all that is left of a causeway built by the Irish giant Finn McCool. Finn was challenged to a fight by Ben and Donner, a Scottish giant. Finn, not one to back down from a fight, accepted and built a causeway from Ireland to Scotland so that they could meet. On the other side of the sea, in a place called Fingal's Cave in Staffa, Scotland, there are identical columns, which makes sense where the story comes from.
As I looked out across the sea in the direction I assumed Rathlin Island was in, I thought about my connection to it. There is a website called My True Ancestry that compares your DNA samples with ancient DNA samples. I don't want to recommend it or not recommend it. I don't know everything about this company. I mostly take it as entertainment and it gives me clues and new directions to follow while I learn about my ancestry. On My True Ancestry, it says that I share a DNA connection to an early Bronze Age man that lived on Rathlin Island around 1950 BC. The sample is from a person researchers call Rathlin One. I found some facial recreations and this is him. done with my Ireland series, I plan on doing a video or series of videos on different DNA and family tree building websites I've used, and then I'll talk more about my experiences and matches, so stay tuned. I went to Ireland to find out more about my ancestry and where my ancestors come from. I went with so many questions and came back with more questions and less answers, <laughs> if that makes sense but I came back with a full heart. So I guess that kind of makes it even. If you find pockets of royalty or historically significant people in your lineage, research is so much easier. There are books written on them, there are documentaries, podcasts, monuments often still stand that you can go to and experience. It is thrilling to take a look back through history and connect to it from such a height. I love learning about my more visible ancestors, but I would also really love to learn about the not so visible. Just the regular folks who lived their lives out of the spotlight and then faded into the shadows. But the research is so much more difficult. Sometimes all you have is a name or a birth date or a death date. And when I came to Ireland, I had every intention on learning about these relatives too, but eight days was not enough time. I have ancestors that come from all over Ireland. Limerick, Dublin, Tipperary, Cork, Sheetram, Carlow, Ardfin and Roscray, Nuts Corner, Castle Hill, and so many more. I want to mention a few of them here. William P. Finley, my third great-grandfather, was born in 1804 in County Antrim, Northern Ireland, and died January 23rd, 1879 in Victoria Harbor, Nova Scotia. I have searched high and low, and I cannot find any information pre-immigration about him or my third great-grandmother, Mary Long Finley, who also came from Ireland. There's also Edward McBride, a sixth great-grandfather. He was also born in County Antrim in 1745 and died in 1845 in Granville, Annapolis, Nova Scotia. James McComb, my sixth great-grandfather, was born in 1775 in Castle Hill, Ireland, and died in 1868 in Nuts Corner, Antrim. If you're also related to these people and have more information, please feel free to reach out on Instagram or Facebook, or you can email uh, shipinastar at gmail.com. I drove all day, and out the window I saw so much beauty. I could spend a year there and still not see all I would like to see. I had to skip Belfast and that really stung. Among all the other amazing things I wanted to see, I was really excited to see the Titanic Museum, but I realized I would need more than just a few hours to experience Belfast properly, so next time I plan on starting there. I stayed just outside Belfast in Hillsborough. I had never heard of it before, but it is the place where the Queen would stay when visiting Northern Ireland. It's also the place where that famous video of the new King Charles was freaking out about getting pen all over his hands. Now, with that context, I wish I had explored it more, but I needed supplies, so I went to the mall instead and bought a ton of random things to try on camera, and then I forgot to film it. What can I say? I'm a rookie to this vlog lifestyle, but I will say the little black currant tarts I bought from Marks and Spencers were mwah, delish. I'd also like to note how freaking incredible the B&B was that I stayed at. This isn't an ad, I just loved the place so much. I would love to live there. 